Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Joris, for jumping on the How to Build an App podcast with us. Um, super excited to have you guys on. Joris, what's your background in, you know, how did you get into development? Let's start there. Hi. Uh, thank you for welcoming us here today. Um, so my name is Joris. My background is uh, I'm from, uh, from France. I'm a French guy. And I've been doing a lot of studies in mathematics, physics, engineering sciences, this kind of stuff. And last year of my master's degree, I went into robotics. And into robotics, I discovered that I loved computer vision uh, algorithms. And so I went to do a PhD after that. So three years about using neural networks, doing AI on images. And uh, then after the PhD, I went to EDF. EDF is Electricity of France, which is the, um, one of the biggest energy provider in Europe and in the world. And I worked as a data scientist to build web app uh, to serve data scientist algorithm to engineer in the, in the plant to help them analyze that data. And then I meet Carl at Entrepreneur First, but I won't tell too much about that right now. I, I want to point out, I love how you're like, yeah, I loved algorithms and uh, <laughs> computer science. I, I feel like that's a bane of every computer science person's like <laughs> existence, doing those algorithms and data structures. So, so super stoked to hear that you like that. That's funny. So, yeah. so Carl, Carl, tell us a little bit about, about your background. I'm kind of sure. curious about that. Uh, so I'm from the UK, as, uh, as you can probably tell. Uh, I actually did a computer science degree way back when, uh, 2004, I graduated. That shows how old I am. Um, worked in consulting for a bit, wasn't my thing, uh, and then moved to China. So I lived in Beijing for about seven years. I uh, went over there because a friend was there to start a startup. We actually launched a couple of startups over there. Uh, built an iPhone app, um, which we sold, which was a success story. Tried to build a translation marketplace, which we didn't sell. <laughs> we managed to sell the, the IP at the end, but uh, that didn't go so well, that one. Um, worked as a product manager in a chatbot startup uh, and then decided to come back to Europe uh, and move to France. So this is how I ended up in Paris. I actually met my girlfriend, um, Veronique, in uh, in Beijing. Um, and then I uh, actually did a data science master's when I got to Paris to kind of refresh my technical skills, you know, another another run at the uh, the technical side of things. Uh, again, discovered that it's fun, but it's probably not the career for me. <laughs> um, and uh, that was the point where I realized, yeah, startups, it, it's the thing. And I should really stick to, to product and to sales and, and that side of things. So I joined Entrepreneur First as well. And that's how I met Joris. Let's kind of like go into that. So basically, both of you, it sounds like you, uh, Carl, have both kind of like a product and a technical background and you, Joris, with the technical background, how did you two meet and um, start working together? So Entrepreneur First, it's a, it's a special kind of incubator. There's lots of incubators and accelerators out there, but Entrepreneur First is kind of unique um, in that they take people who have literally on their own with no product, no prototype, uh, no co-founder, uh, not even an idea. Um, and so they look at the person, first of all, which is probably why they're called Entrepreneur First, because it's all about the entrepreneur. Um, and then they, you go through this system, which is this kind of extended recruitment system where um, they pay you up or they help you find uh, somebody to pair up with, I should say, based on your okay. specialism. So you've got the technical edge, which obviously that was Joris. You've got the domain edge, which was me. And I can tell you why in a bit. Um, and you've got other kind of edges, but they, they try and pay you up. Um, and then you go through this kind of uh, matching uh, process. And then if you find somebody who you get along with and, and, and makes sense to start a business with, then you go about validating uh, uh, ideas and you ideate and then you validate those ideas with uh, uh, you know, the customer base. Um, and then you pitch that idea to entrepreneur first. And if they like it, they invest in you. And this is the process that Joris and I went through. What, what is very fun about this story is that before meeting Carl, I did this program one time before and I, <laughs> I teamed up with someone else. The funny in this program is that you team up with a lot of people and they encourage you to break up the team. So if it's not, if you don't find product market fit, if you don't find an idea, uh -huh. if you don't like the person you're working with, just break up, start again. There is 60 percent available. Just try and try and try again. Mm -hmm. So I did the program twice, and then I met Carl, which was the perfect fit. So, so okay. just to just to kind of reiterate, you've done the program before with somebody else. It wasn't a great fit, so you guys break up. And then you go through yes. it again and you meet someone else and you do that until you find product market fit. It's even worse than that. In, in the program <laughs> itself, for one session, you break up again and again and again. So you can have a team <laughs> in, in two or three weeks if you want. So it's not, that's not a good sign. So the first time I did the program, I, I met like three person, three people. And uh, I went to the jury with the last of them. And they said no to us because of different reasons we can speak about. 
And uh, after that, I break up officially with my teammates. And they told me, hey, Joris, come do it again. And this time I met Carl from the very beginning, even before the program, we started matching up. We matched and we never break up. And so we, we, we presented to the jury and we got it. It's like speed dating for business. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yeah. That's that's incredible. That's that's amazing that that program. And I've, I honestly I haven't heard of Entrepreneur First. What what do you guys feel like was one of your favorite aspects of that incubator? Uh, well, meeting Joris, I would say, was the, the, the best outcome, to be honest, because, you know, I'd been in France for a few years, but I, you know, I'd done a, like I said, a data science master. So I knew, a, you know, a few students, but I didn't have a big network here. Um, and so finding a co-founder who was technically capable, uh, available, motivated, like all of these things, that's a, you know, that's a really hard thing to do is find, that, especially a technical co-founder. Um, whereas Entrepreneur mm-hmm. First will basically put that on a plate for you and say, here's a room, half of them are technical co-founders. Now go and find the, you know, your perfect match. Um, and so, and then they coach you through that process as well. So that that really is the the best thing about it, uh, as well as the standard of the people in general. And we've met a lot of really high caliber entrepreneurs. A lot of people are doing really well out the program. They've literally just had their first unicorn, their first billion dollar company uh, wow. come out of that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, absolutely, they're doing a good job over there. I would like a little background about that. So, what made you like initially attend Entrepreneur First? And I'll start with you, Carl, and then I've got the same question for you, Joris. Uh, for me, it was uh, you know, it was a realization that startups is the place that I needed to be. Uh, actually, after I after I did the data science masters here, I actually went into a, a big company uh, to be a data scientist or whatever for six months. It didn't work out. You know, I felt like I did an okay job, but I was never going to be great at it. And I think they realized that too. Um, and so. For me, it was about returning to startups where I felt I belonged, uh, doing you know a role that would involve you know some kind of product management or creating creating something from scratch in a new market, being innovative. This is um, you know it was really the perfect offer for me because not only do they help match you up with a, with a founder, but they actually give you a little bit of money to get started as well. So <laughs> when you're made unemployed from a you know a big company and you're thinking, all right, what am I going to do? Am I going to you know find another job that you know maybe isn't the right fit? Oh, they're going to they're going to help me find a co-founder and give me a bit of money to do it as well. So I've got a bit of breathing room. Perfect. You know, like it was just a match made in heaven, really. Yeah, that sounds like a huge win. Mm. Like, um, I feel like the really like the hard, literally like the hardest parts of starting any business is finding that like technical person and getting funding to get off, get off the ground. Like once you mm. get those two things kind of like figured out, you're usually in a pretty good spot. Um, and then Joris, like what inspired you to go to Entrepreneur First? So a big degree, you could say you can do a lot of technical stuff and it's booming right now, uh, even still now. And it was already 10 years ago, but still. Um, and I was always attracted by innovative stuff, you know, gadget, tech stuff, new technology. And I was looking for my own idea for a long time. But when you do your PhD in France, sometimes there is a bad reputation on PhDs. If you have a PhD, it's some, someone who can search, but it's not someone who is looking to find, who is going to find. You can search, but don't find. Okay, It's like mm. the sentence you hear in French. Un chercheur qui trouve, on en cherche, mais des chercheurs qui trouve, on n'en trouve pas. It's like something like that. <laughs> and um, I was like, okay, so I have to convert my PhD to be a degree which is going to be recognized by the professional world. So I was like, okay, where, where can I convert that? So I went to ODF for two years, Electricity of France, so that I can say, look at that. I've got a PhD, yes, but I've been working for one of the big tech companies of France. So I'm like an engineer like everybody else, and plus I have a PhD. But uh-huh. I was always waiting for my the, the good time slot to do it. And I had an idea about facial recognition because it's what I was able to do during my PhD. And finally, I quit ODF and I was, okay, I want to do my company. And I went to some accelerators, some incubators in Paris, and they said, oh, it's fine. You have a great idea, but you're alone. You have no team here. You should find someone else. And mm. have you been considering entrepreneur first? And entrepreneur first just contacted me two weeks before on LinkedIn. So I say, okay, let's do that. So and that's where I am now. You guys have two very different paths when it comes to how you guys got to the same place. And now now you guys are together. Now, Carl, can we talk a little bit about what Rumble Studios is? So mm-hmm. so our, our listeners can kind of know what Rumble Studio Studios are, is, are. 
Uh, well, is in fact, yeah. So it's Rumble Studio, singular. <laughs> there oh, yeah. is a Rumble Studios. Uh, we should have checked before we named the company, but uh, I think they're <laughs> they're also, I think, a media production agency on the other side of the world. But we, you know, we won't talk too, too much about them. Um, wish them the best of luck and all that. Uh, but uh, yeah, Rumble Studio is uh, is a SaaS. It's a software as a service tool uh, that enables businesses, marketing departments, content marketers to create audio content uh, in much less time than uh, is currently possible. Uh, and we do that with a you know a unique system, which is uh, the asynchronous uh, interview system, where instead of having a live podcast conversation like you're doing right now, um, we uh, offer the the chance to set some questions up front, send an invitation, and then have the guests record their answers. Now, this is uh, sounds like a, an audio questionnaire, and in its current format, that's basically what it is: uh, question answer, question answer. But the vision of the company and the reason you need a CTO with a PhD and, uh, and everything is because <laughs> it's not stopping there. Uh, it's that we're going to actually add this uh, the layer of conversational AI, which allows uh, the machine to have a back and forth conversation in real time with the guest. And so these initial questions act like seed questions, com- conversation starters, topic topic markers or chapters, uh, and then from each of those follows uh, you know, a multi-tone conversation that uh, elicits more audio from the guest uh, and also increases the, the spontaneity and the dynamic nature of the conversation. And this is really what we're building is a you know, conversational machine. Uh, and that's the thing that really gets me excited. That's super interesting, mainly because I feel like the, one of the big things about podcasting or like the personal things is being able to jump on and like see things like face to face. What's like the feedback you've been getting just in general with like this new approach to it? Yeah, for sure. So it's it's certainly not going to replace what we're doing right now, which is a, you know a live spontaneous conversation, especially between multiple people. Uh, but the the feedback we're getting from our initial business customers, they love the fact that you can take time to consider what questions you're going to ask. Uh, you can take time to respond to the the answers when they come back. Uh, there can be a you know a check at each level, so businesses you know quite risk averse, so they can consider what had been said, what they're going to put out there next. Uh, it makes the edit super super easy because all the audio is pre-segmented, so they can chop and change, move things around, delete the bits they don't like, reuse parts in future episodes if they want. Um, and so it's a different way of doing things, uh, but it's a uh, it's a very uh, predictable, uh, a very efficient way of doing things as well. Because the other thing about asynchronous, uh, and this is one of the main reasons why I wanted to create the product in the first place, actually, is that you can scale yourself once you create one set of questions. You can send that not just to one person, but to a hundred people if you like, and wait for that answer to come back in. Every, every interview is going to be a little bit different, even with just the, the exact same initial questions. Of course, when we mm-hmm. add the, the conversational AI bot, things are, you know, every conversation is going to be completely unique. Um, and so you can capture a lot more audio in a lot less time. And that's really one of the biggest problems with creating audio content, right? It's very linear. Uh, we had to today schedule uh, an interview. We, all four of us had to be online at the same time. Uh, we had to use uh, you know, a voice over IP software to be able to record this stuff. And we're suffering internet connectivity issues as we speak. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of downsides to doing these live interviews. Then once you download that audio, you're going to have to edit the entire thing again, right? And nobody loves doing that. So if you don't want to do it yourself, and trust me, after 85 episodes, you don't want to do it yourself, you then outsource it. Uh, and that's a cost, you know, that's a cost that you have to cover. So then you have to think about, oh, how am I going to monetize this? Am I getting enough money from the podcast or from the audio content in order to make it worth paying someone to edit? All of this comes into play and it, it serves as you know multiple barriers to entry. And that's why a lot of small companies these days just don't bother. You know, they stick with the emailing and the social media and they look at they mm-hmm. say, podcast, well, we'd love to, but you know, it's a little bit much for us right now. We've only got two people in the marketing team. Maybe next year, you know, we'll leave it for now. And that's a shame. We believe that, you know, everybody should be producing audio content. Uh, and if we can provide a tool that, uh, you know, allows small companies or individuals to be able to produce audio, you know, um, consistently with minimal effort. Uh, and where the ROI really makes sense, then we're going to massively increase the number of people who actually do so uh, and then add diversity to the whole podcasting uh, and audio content ecosystem. Wow. Yeah, I, I just like the idea of like this, a, the, the concept of async communication, especially during COVID. I think I like we've all noticed that more and more people hate getting on meetings, hmm. like you get the fatigue of just being on video and a lot of like new companies, one that I'm specifically like recall is like Bali, which is basically trying to come in as like Slack's new workspace competitor. And it's all oh, yeah. about async communication, no texting, it's all video. Um, and it'll be super interesting to see if like 
the market actually like adopts to the more of like the async uh, way of communication. So super stoked for mm-hmm. that. I think the next kind of like question or the thing that I'm curious about is what when did you guys know that this product like was worth like going all in on? So kind of like timeline perspective, you guys went to this incubator, you met each other, you guys did some validation. What did that look like? And when did you know, okay, this is like a rock star idea. I need to go all in, get this to market and uh, see where it takes you. Yeah, I, I just want first to say something about async, which is part of the answer. A- async is not just about one after the other. It's what you do every day with WhatsApp, with Messenger. It's not audio, it's text, but it works. You can have very funny conversation with your friends and family just using async conversation. The only difference is that we want to do it by audio. So as you said, there is a lot of app doing this kind of stuff now. We can record audio, we can send an answer and do some testimonials. This kind of stuff exists. So the hard bit is how do we make it interactive? How do we add follow-up questions? So this is what Rumble want to do to make it closer to the podcast than just the basic async conversations that we that everybody can do on WhatsApp. So uh, George, I, I'm... Sorry, I'm just yes. curious on on the technical side of things. What have you found is the struggle on that when it comes to like what what was the big obstacle that you saw? Like, why has nobody done this before? Is a is a okay. better question. So, as a as a deep learning expert, I know that training a model to do some specific task, you won't have a hundred percent success on your predictions on your inferences. You will have failure. So, how do you manage that? This is a very big difficulty. So what we decided with Carl is to build first a low-tech platform where we have this async WhatsApp-like conversation so that we can also already have feedback from customers to how async is managed and how the audio quality is. What can we do about that? And we, even before AI, we already have a lot of problems. We, we can see that a lot of people do not have um, a mic like a studio mic. They use their AirPods, which is horrible when you want to record audio. Hmm. They use their laptop or they tap on the microphone, which I'm doing right now, so that everybody has a demonstration of it. Um, this kind of stuff, it's very hard to, to avoid with people which are new to it. And most of the time when you do a podcast, you are the host, you invite a guest, which is not always a host of another podcast. So they are new to that. So you have to give them advice. You have to explain them how to do and what not to do, not go f- uh, close to the mic and move away from it. These kind of mistakes that everybody do at the beginning. Uh, this is first difficulty is that you don't need AI for. And uh, it's already hard for us to detect it, to measure it. So we first have a brick to, um, to measure all this stuff, uh, provide metrics so that we can detect people doing mistakes and give them simple coach coaching so that they can improve themselves. So it's not only about improving the sound quality and, and saying, please change your mic. It's also about giving them advice on how to use the mic, how to speak, speak slower, speak faster, this kind of stuff. Even that is hard. Then we see for AI, which is for this summer. Interesting. And what I want to do too, mainly because um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, what I'll do is I'll ask you, um, Carl. So initially, like going back to like that validation piece, like, when did you know that, like, you both were going to go all in on this product? Like, well, what, what metric did you guys hit? Yeah, I mean, we did we did customer development conversations with more than 100 different companies, you know, small companies, big companies. We we're really casting our net pretty wide. You know, I was speaking to PR companies because they're often the gatekeeper to these, uh, you know, thought leaders. Speaking to st- startups, you know, and agencies and huge companies like Oracle and Talos, you know, trying to understand, you know, are you interested in producing audio content? And uh, what are the challenges around that? And what we discovered was that, you know, everybody's interested in audio these days. They're interested because podcasts are booming, because uh, voice assistants are on the rise. And uh, nowadays it's clubhouse and social audio and all of, the, all of these mm-hmm. things, it's just audio all the time. So everyone's thinking, how do we get involved? What are we missing out on? There's a lot of FOMO. Um, but what we found was, you know, the big companies were already pr- producing audio, whether it was for external branding purposes or just internal communications, which is another huge niche. Um, but they were unhappy with it because the tools were slow to use and it takes up, you know, the marketing marketing team's time. Uh, but they had the marketing team, you know, those huge companies, they got the budget. The smaller companies or the the individual PR firm or, you know, people with, you know, just on their own, the creators, the solopreneurs, 
Uh, they just don't have the time to just do all this stuff. And you guys know full well how, how much effort it takes to produce audio. And when you've got a business to run at the same time, some, it's not the, the top priority. And so they're like, we'd love to have one, but you know, maybe next year, as, as I was saying. Um, and we had heard this, you know, over and over again. It was already an intuition that I'd had because, you know, I'd done a podcast and this is something I maybe I didn't explain before, but I'm the host of the Voice Tech podcast. It's a podcast and it's about voice technology. So I spend, you know, my weeks speaking to voice technology experts about smart speakers, conversational AI. So I learned about all these core new technologies, uh, but I also learned how difficult it is to produce a podcast. So, you know, personally, I was like, okay, there's got to be a better way than this. Looked online, there, there really wasn't a better way. This is it, you know, record it live and then edit it afterwards. Um, but, you know, because these new technologies exist, maybe there's a better way to do it, or maybe there's a different way to do it. Uh, and then speaking to, with all these companies just basically validated that. It just reinforced uh, my own opinions that's dangerous because you have to be careful of confirmation bias you know like am i just hearing what i want to hear uh but it really was across the board and uh i had enough conviction in the conversation we had um to to push ahead with the idea that said i don't think any startup who's especially ones who are creating something genuinely new like us could ever say with 100 percent certainty that what we're building is absolutely definitely needed and you never quite know where the product market fit will lie so we're still experimenting right now still the big question like where is product market fit but I think async definitely has potential in one way or another. I uh, just to, would like to add something on the validation side. Uh, Entrepreneur First is an example uh, there is a lot of others who had a podcast before, but they stopped it. They stopped mm -hmm. it because the person doing the podcast left the company. And you can see this pattern in a lot of other companies. When the person with the tech capability to do the podcast left, it's end of the podcast. And I don't know the numbers, but Carl can can give them about the number of non-active podcast show. It's it's huge. Yep. And when you speak to people who stop the show, it's because they don't have the tech anymore to do it. The tech person, they don't have the time to do it anymore. And they decided that the ROI is, is too poor to, to continue on it. Or they were too impatient. You know, they expected results after the first three episodes and they weren't seeing a lift in sales. And so they just gave it up. I think it's that, you know, they, they quote 1.8 million podcasts on Apple Podcasts now. I think it is. The number keeps going up. Maybe we're at 2 million now. Um, but I think it's around half of those are inactive. So they haven't had one, any episode published in the last month. And of, of the active ones, half of those have fewer than seven episodes. And so most people give up. It's huge attrition. And that tells you something about podcasting in general and, and how difficult it is to, to keep going, to maintain that consistency. Our producer who goes in and does all the work and, and all of that is listening to this right now thinking, no, no, this makes sense because a podcast can be kind of a lot of work, right? And, and be able to go through. And so voice tech really was kind of the seed for Rumble Studios. Would you agree? For me, absolutely. That's where, that's where the idea came from is both, you know, doing the podcast, feeling the pain of podcasting, and then speaking about voice tech and having a solution, you know, in front of my face, basically. Uh, and looking to merge the two worlds together. And to be honest, we're seeing it already. We're seeing uh, text-to-speech just coming on leaps and bounds. You know, synthetic voices these days are so good that it, to me, it was a no-brainer that we're going to start listening to these things in content. You know, already there are screen readers and, uh, you know, plugins that you can get that read blog pages to you that sound better and better. You're seeing it in video games now. So co the content we consume every day is becoming more and more synthesized. Uh, and so why not a podcast? Why not the audio content we listen to, listen to every day? Not all podcasts. Uh, you know, if you're Joe Rogan, I don't think you've anything to worry about. Um, but there, there's a huge, we believe, a huge latent demand for audio content creation by people who don't really want to become podcasters. They don't want to learn to become great interviewers. They haven't got the time for that. You know, it's not their passion project. But they do want to have audio content. So what's the cheapest, quickest, easiest way that they can do that and still produce audio content that's engaging to listen to? That's Rumble Studio. So it sounds like you guys are basically tackling two problems. And the, and the first one is just the problem of barrier to entry and like the work that it requires to get everything up and running. But then the second one you're also tackling is for the experienced podcasters, like getting them to come in and being bought in on that. I feel like it's probably a challenge and something like you're working towards. And what's kind of been, and I'm curious, like what's kind of been like your like direction on that? in terms of educating people on this podcast way of async communication and getting them to, to go in and, and support something like this and, and bring it into their show. Mm. 
Well, a, a good portion of pod podcasters will never use Rumble Studio. You know, they love podcasting for further conversations, so we're not going to convert everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, nor that we nor that we uh, wouldn't want to try either. But uh, for the companies that we've been speaking with, specifically the ones in the voice tech domain, because this is the ones you know that where I've got my network. You know, these are very audio first, you know, audio friendly type people. They're always thinking about audio and voice, so they don't need a huge amount of convincing about you know, the power of audio. And they're always looking mm -hmm. for new creative ways to to use it. And so these are the people that we focused on first. Um, I'm thinking of the Conversation Design Institute. You know, these are people who train. Uh, companies, big companies, on how to use conversation design. Uh, and these have been uh, one of our first customers who've actually tried it out. We recently did uh, an event with them, an online event on Hopin, where we put a link, you gave us a, a booth, uh, and we actually had uh, you know the attendees of the event click the link and go in and take part in a conversation, right? Which is a, a great way to engage with your uh, guests, your, your attendees, and also capture some some great audio content that you can put in a podcast later on. And, you know, we've got another, another customer who is... Uh, uh, a voice tech startup who, who's doing a branded podcast straight up. They wanted just an easy way to get capture audio from their partners, but in a very consistent way, in a safe way, uh, and you know, created by somebody who'd never created a podcast before. So they need it to be reliable and have those checks, you know, management reviewing all that. So we're experimenting with different use cases with different customer types. Um, but uh, in general, the the feeling from the the voice tech community and these audio friendly types has been very positive. And our aim now as a company is to get a few of these case studies under our belt, so we can demonstrate the power of audio and and, and our platform to the people who need, maybe need a little bit more convincing, who really don't appreciate the the power of audio as much. How long ago exactly did you start Rumble Studio, and where would you say you're at acquisition wise for customers? Like, how many do you think you have? And what are kind of like your plans to increase that number? Because I think people listening to this would be like, because it's it's newer, it's something you're still working on and it's not a past conversation. I think it'll be super interesting uh, for our listeners. Mm. Okay, so we've got a, a two-pronged approach. <laughs> uh, one is the self-service platform where you can just go and sign up. And these are people who are generally discover us through our content marketing. So of course, we've launched a podcast. It's called Audio Leads. You should go and check it out. It's all about audio content marketing, unsurprisingly. We've got a newsletter. We've got social media. Uh, shout out to the, the content marketing team that they were putting out all that content every week. So people who see that online are likely to just arrive on our site, read the site if they get it, or it's a problem they already have, sign up and give it a go. Um, and uh, at the moment, it's free to use. We're going to have a freemium plan with a you know usage component. And then the other side of the business is me on the phone speaking to these businesses, getting the user feedback, and actually providing a more kind of bespoke service. Uh, and at the same time, capturing all that feedback and relaying it to Jory so he can improve the product for, for those people. And that's going to be the enterprise plan. Uh, it's going to be supported by various services like... You know, if it's a branded podcast they're creating, we can help you with the, the strategy of the podcast, the positioning. We can help you with the editing uh, after the fact. We can do all of the, uh, the uh, you know, the extra services that are required as well. So the self-service product is really for people who know what they're doing or want to do it independently and use it as an audio recorder, first and foremost. And then the enterprise plan is for people who want the entire service and want to solve that problem for their business. And that means working with me for the moment. Lucky them. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> George. Oh, we will. Don't worry. Um, no, the, one of the one of the interesting things I think, you know, Carl, is you're like, okay, I have this idea, George. I'm a rock star in development. I know how to do it. We have this brilliant idea. We want to go forward. What was your avenue? And and maybe Entrepreneur First kind of helped with this. But like, how did you get your first customer? Like, mm -hmm. did you go out and when you were doing this validation, did you do pre-sales or how did you get that first customer? Because I feel like we have a lot of founders that are like, have this great idea. Did you do pre-sales? Did you have a product that you actually showed them? Kind of what was that journey like? Yeah, George, I don't know if it was first customer or first user, because I think we had some no, users. I think the question is about okay, during validation, to give a piece of the answer, during the validation at Entrepreneur First. Uh, when you go to the jury, you have to show, to demonstrate that people are interested in the idea at least or in the product itself. And so we, we signed a 13 uh, letter of intent uh, and asked for payment against it, like 50 euros, which was at this moment. So certain mm. customers paid 50 euros for one episode at least or starting using the platform, which was at the prototype level. And they were not going to be charged these 50 euros until the product was ready. And we signed in the months following before, after the jury of entrepreneur first, before going face to the investors, because it's a very fast track system. Jury is yes. You go to investors one month later, mm -hmm. which was the, the demo day. 
And uh, for Demo Day, we try to have more customers with bigger check. And for that, that's the plan that Carl just talked about, about enterprise grade uh, assistance, helping users yeah. to create their podcast. That's it. We sold a, a package of three episodes for 300 bucks, which is an absolute bargain. <laughs> it's like totally underpricing yeah. it, but it's just, we just wanted to, to prove. You, just need to get, just, you need to get some sales. Like you need the number. It. We need to check that off, right? <laughs> Absolutely. We need to show that businesses would be willing to produce audio content with our tool and put their reputation behind it, basically. Like the money is kind of negligible, but we, we wanted to show that they'd be willing to reach in their pockets at least and 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 do this. But really the, the, the test is to show that they'd be willing to produce audio content. So we did this, we sold what, five packages at 300 bucks each um, to some decent, really, you know, good companies with, with you know, well-known companies. And um, and then that was enough to, to get through the, the demo day. So, okay. sorry, one last follow-up question. And, and this is kind of for yours. When it comes to talking to those customers, and, and getting that feedback, uh, how do you guys decide, like, let's say a customer says, hey, I wish it had this, or I wish it had that, right? I mean, you have a lot of customers that say what they think they need. How do you decide what to really execute and change? And what is something that maybe isn't as priority? Yeah. So there is two kinds of feedback, I would say. Yeah, there is, of course, the feedback like, this button is not working. So we- It's good feedback. Let's call it a, let's call it a bug. <laughs> So this is like a priority. If the features we have don't even work, let's work on that first. But about the big feature, even before uh, listening to our users, we have a vision with Carl, which is made of main features. We know what we want. We have an idea of what we want, and this is what we want to iterate on. So all those feedback that Carl gets from our users, we have a big database of them. We put all of them there. But still, there is a lot of issues we need to implement even before using those feedback. So like payment, for example, if you want to have people paying us automatically with Stripe, let's, let's implement that even before adding a specific brand feature coming from a specific user. Because as Carl said, we want to have a self-service platform. So to have a self-service platform, to have users on, on it, not 50, but 500, 5,000, at this moment, feedback will be statistically relevant. And for now, I think it's not enough. So we need more users. It is tricky when uh, when the users say, well, can you just add this? Or can you just change that? Because I mean, one thing I, I get a lot is, so you're going to add video? And it's like, well, n not, not yet, not yet. I mean, it, it's hard enough doing an audio conversation without adding all the complexity of video. People are like, will oh, you add video, live? You know, we yeah, add too. <laughs> will you add live? I mean, it's just so many things, right? And so you could easily get dragged in different directions. But like Joyce is saying, if you've got that clear vision, then if the users are saying, well, like we need to accomplish this task and we can think, and we say, okay, the, the, the product that we're building according to our vision could help you with this, then we can tweak it in that direction for you. But if it's completely off the vision, it's completely off the roadmap, I think you have to be very selective about responding to that. Kind of stick to your guns, right? We have a plan and we're going to execute yes. this plan. And if, if, if what they present to us deviates from the plan, we're not going to do it. But if it can help improve the plan, then that's mm. something we put on a priority. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that, that's super smart. And it's actually really interesting because we've had the, the founder of Zencaster and Squadcast on our shows before. And they talked about the challenges when it comes to developing audio with video and the challenges that they have with internet connectivity issues that we have or, mm. or different things. So George, one of my questions is what is a big challenge that you ran into when you're developing rumble studio? What was like something that you were like, okay, I had no idea that was going to be a big issue, but it really became a technically difficult issue other than yeah. people not knowing how to use a mic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, I'm a PhD in AI. I'm not a front-end developer. I've been doing a lot of web development. I've been building some web app, but I'm not a senior front-end developer. And when it comes to audio recording using the browser, so we are not building native apps, not iOS app, not Android apps. We are building a progressive web app, which is a browser app. Uh, manipulating audio will depend on which browser is used. Safari, Firefox, Google Chrome will use some different API sometimes or are not at the same level of features they provide. So you have to be able to uh, handle those use cases, those edge cases, and you use what we call polyfills to help you on that. But it's a real problem. So Safari was a nightmare for me at the beginning because I'm a, I'm a Unix guy. I've been using Unix and Google Chrome for a very long time, and I'm not such a MacBook guy. And uh, 
most of people doing podcasts or listening to it come from the Apple world and uh, mm -hmm. they use Safari, like all of them. <laughs> and uh, so the platform we were building, the first prototypes, uh, the audio recording bit was not working. Mm. Uh, so this is one of the bugs that was a nightmare for me. <laughs> After one month, I, I got it. I managed it, but it has been a, a latent problem for a long time. So now it's robust, but still at the beginning, it was hard. So as a technical person, like going in and solving this problem, and the reason I bring this up is when you're building a new product, one thing that often happens is as a developer, you really like outline this thing that you're going to do, you start building it, and then you typically realize, oh man, this is a pain and this is where we're at. And like, how did you explain like that pain point of, to Carl, like, hey, this is going to extend like our timeline, like 30 days. This is a super hard feature. Here's why. That that can be like a really hard thing to communicate. And I'm curious, Joris, how did you explain that to Carl? And Carl, how did you respond to that? So on the tech side, of course, especially when you're building a prototype, you change a lot of stuff. We change the stack yeah. several times, three times actually. And each time for a specific reason, like, okay, at the beginning it was a prototype, let's do it fast. And then we want to have a prototype which can handle 50 percent at the same time. Okay, so let's change the stack. Now, now we want to build something robust. We have finance. We can go on something stronger. So let's do something that is going to be stable. Uh, yeah. So those changes, of course, change the ro technical roadmap. Uh, even though we put some, uh, how do you say that, uh, margins on those. Uh, mm. But still, Carl has a little bit of a technical background. He, he made a data scientist uh, master degree, and uh, he's been working on on uh, the dev of apps before uh, as a product owner, I guess I remember. And uh, so he understands. He understands what I'm saying, Carl. I'm going to invest two weeks on this specific mm. subject. He say, okay, I understand. This kind of stuff can take time. So we have um, very honest and comprehensive. Uh, communication with those subjects, there was no problem here, I guess. So it was really more just you you had the opportunity because Carl, you have that technical background to just be transparent. Like, hey, here's the technical things we have to do um, and it's going to extend our time two weeks. But Carl, on the product side, I imagine your head was probably spinning a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think Joris has made some excellent decisions on the on the you know the development side of things. And like you said, we started with a small MVP, validated that, got some feedback, you know, on the UX primarily, and then we've done I don't know we're on MVP five now I think. So gone through multiple yeah. iterations, um, and uh, it has been it has been a little bit frustrating at times. But at the same time, we've made a conscious decision to to go a little bit slower to be a bit slower on the hiring and stuff as opposed to like, you know, the go big, go home approach that some, uh, some of our contemporaries have taken so that Joris can spend a bit more time building the infrastructure, making it more stable. And so we can go through these multiple iterations so to eventually get to something that, you know, meets the consumer need, but then also is actually, you know, stable and doesn't, it isn't full of tech debt, for example, because I've worked mm -hmm. on, worked on products. I've been, you know, worked in startups before where, you know, the product changes left and right, uh, and it becomes a bit of a mess. And you wish if you'd spent a little bit more time at the beginning sorting that out, then you wouldn't be in this problem right now. Uh, and we're in a great position right now because, Joris, I think you've just literally finished all the infrastructure components now. We've got continuous integration and all this cool stuff, you know, unit testing and all that. So when we make our big hires, the big expensive hires, they come on and we're paying them, X, you know, $1,000 a month. But they're building code that will stay on the, you know, the code base that's going to stay there for a while. You know, we're not going to have to redo it all in a year when we realize it's, uh, you know, it's all broken again. So yeah, I have confidence. Yeah. And, and I think that's like one thing that really gets lost by a lot of founders is like the technical debt piece of things that going back and doing and setting something up right mm. is always going to be better in the long run. Sure, you might get out two weeks faster, but in a month when you're wanting to modify that feature, it's going to take three weeks instead of two. Mm. Um, and that number just keeps compounding and getting bigger the more that you don't allow the developers to go back, refactor something and set something up the right way. Mm. So yeah. flexibility is also super important. Now, Carl, there's got to be a time when Joris came to you and said, hey, <laughs> this is going to be extended, this has to be rebuilt, or or something, and you were just like, oh my gosh, like this is getting crazy. How do you navigate those conversations? He's looking for well, that. I think that's like a, 
<laughs> yep, I'm looking for the gossip because I gossip, think yeah. every founder, every founder is going to have that point where they're like, I don't know if my product's going to be built. I don't know like don't. if <laughs> like if, if this is going to get out. And yeah. I imagine at some point like you were probably in the same boat. Like you might have known it was going to get out, but man, this is just taking super long. How do you how do you typically mm. appro- approach Doris and what advice would you give to founders in a similar situation? Uh, so, you know, I've actually worked on projects that have taken a lot longer to make progress than this one. So I've actually got <laughs> a background that supports the, the, the rate at which we're developing. Uh, I don't think our, uh, disagreements have been around, you know, whether it's going to be out or not, like Joris builds very quickly. We just have to build a lot of stuff, you know, like it's just, it's a complicated mm-hmm. app to build. Um, yep. our disagreements have been more around design because, mm-hmm. you know, our, our roles as co-founders, there's only a few people in the team, right? So it's clear anything like hard dev. Joris does anything sales and mm-hmm. marketing I do but we've both got a kind of a product background you know Joris has been a product owner as well so when it comes to like what features do we build and specifically like how do they work and what what should they look like what how should they behave that's where our kind of you know responsibilities overlap and that's where some of the you know the conflict occurs because Joris wants you know a bit more independence to just design it how you know as he goes you know like as he's developing it I want a bit more certainty over like what we're actually building and that it's going to meet the customer's need and of course, I've got my own ideas of what it should look like. You know, I'm like, oh, I just put a button there. You know, obviously, obviously that's going to work, right? And Joris <laughs> is like, no, like there's three different components we could use. You got to think about all this stuff. So that's where a lot of the um, yeah, that's where you know, a lot of the disagreements. That's where most of, of the few disagreements that we've had, I think, lie is in the in the design stuff. And how we've resolved that is basically <laughs> uh, we when well, we looked at the typical product manager's role, didn't we? We got the job description of a product manager and we divided up the tasks. And then uh, when it came to the actual design piece, like how is the the, the final implementation of these uh, these features decided upon? At first, you know, I wanted to do you know follow the same process that I I followed when I worked at you know a startup with thirty people, which is make a specification document, get it reviewed, costed, go through the whole process. This is way too heavy for just you know two guys in a room. And so mm-hmm. in the end, Joris convinced me that that you need to basically delegate or delegate handover and relinquish you know control over the, the design of these features so joris can at least put his creative input into it he's got the the you know the needs that i've communicated from the user he's got an idea of how that should work it'll build the first version and then pass it back to me i can comment and i can get feedback from the user and that's actually worked a lot better it's allowed joris to move a lot quicker um and uh, and avoided a lot of the, the conflicts we had before and to be honest the mvp changes so much that niggling over uh, you know, a, a green button versus a blue button, or should we have this, you know, animated thing over here? Like, it's just a waste of time, you know, like, just don't even spend your time on that stuff. Just I'm do it. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. Like, super glad. <laughs> like, so, like, as a, as a developer, so many founders, like, come up and they're like, this font, this color, this, like, five positions to the right. Mm-hmm. Those conversations the always the are just like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah Nightmare. those are always super funny conversations um and it sounds like what allowed you to get through this bit like even the hurdles that you have has just been like this trust and allowing joris to take ownership and really build something that works well like is the direction you guys took and i think that's mm-hmm. super important for founders to know that like there comes a point where you've got to just kind of let the developer you know take the reins get it across the finish line get it to users um, and you can always like circle back and make a change if it really is a big deal. Mm. And it's never overemphasizing those tiny little UI things. Um, it's always about like if a product works, that's like the number one thing. Then you can always go back and spice it up and make things uh, more design ready. Yeah. Well, and I and I just I I just kind of want to think and and for our listeners to like just go back and listen. He's like, listen, the MVP changes so much go into it with that mindset like your mvp is exactly what it is it's an mvp and you're trying to get the consumer as fast as possible so that they can tell you what color they want that stupid button (laughs) if you go into it like this is my baby and i want it exactly the way that i think Mm -hmm. i feel like you're gonna fail you're gonna fail as a business because like it really comes down to is good communication with your with your co-founder right and then also um being willing to change and pivot is really Mm -hmm. kind of kind of important when it comes to like real growth and you guys it sounds like you guys have seen that yes and just to add a layer on on what we agreed on with carl is about the ux 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 how do you say that ux and ui we decided to to postpone the moment that we are going to take ux advice from someone which is its specialty because the product is new what we're building is new nobody has been using ai to have an active effect on the conversation recorded asynchronously 
So we are building, a, I'm going to say, a first stable version of it. And as soon as we have it, which is which will be by this summer, then we, we get the UX guy or girl, and we will be working more closely with the users to improve the size of the button, the colors, what is missing, and all the small features, and take all the feedback we had before to improve it. Mm-hmm. As long as our journey is the correct journey, the actual experience just needs to make sure yes. that, that is that is it. So, so tell us, I, you, you do say you said coming out in the in 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 summer. Is that correct? Is that what you just said? Yes. Okay. So tell me, what are what are you guys' strategy kind of going forward? Are you guys doing a lot of content? Are you guys doing? Obviously, you're pushing the podcast, doing mm-hmm. outreach. Kind of what what's your what's your strategy going forward? So on the the marketing side, for sure, it's lean content marketing right now. We're still raising our you know first pre seed round really with with angels. So uh, if any investors out there listening, then uh, give me a shout, Carl at Rumble Studio. <laughs> um, but uh, with the limited funds that we have at our disposal right now, we're going on the the lean content marketing approach. This means podcasts, newsletter, social media, um, and uh, and then just getting you know focusing on the messaging and getting more and more people to know about Rumble Studio, evangelizing asynchronous as a, as a thing, uh, and also just evangelizing uh, podcasts and branded podcasts for businesses because a lot of businesses are still not convinced that audio will help their business, um, and so we've got a lot a lot of work to do in terms of education. Um, I've got a lot of work to do with working with that that first set of customers to get user feedback as well. Uh, so this gives Joris plenty of time to to build this, you know, this all singing or dancing system. There's a lot of components that we still need to to put into the the platform. Uh, right now, we've got you know uh, something that works, and and I am producing my podcast exclusively with Rumble Studio. So you can use it. Um, you can record uh, questions. You can get capture guest answers. You can scale that, and then you can add your own follow up comments. You can export. You can add your jingle and all that. So it works. Um, but right now, the you, you need a little bit of knowledge or a little bit of coaching to get the results from it. And so Joris is focusing on building something that's stable, but also with all the the onboarding help, the tutorials, the the bubbles that pop up that guide you through that that happy path. Um, all of that needs to happen before we start adding an AI layer as well. So although the AI thing is super sexy and it will add a lot of defensibility to our product in the longer term, there's so much you can do with a product that doesn't have AI. Um, this is what we we really need to focus on it and get that out first. And like just for our founders, I don't know if you heard, but but as you you basically said, there's something I want and something that we really do want to build, but there's things that are more important now that we mm-hmm. need to get out. And the fact that you guys have that vision just speaks volume because there's so many of our clients that we come to us that are like, hey, I want to build this huge vision, right? And I want this as our final product. But in reality, like there is that educational piece, like you have to train your users how to use it. it sounds like you have to train the the market to to show, see the need for something like this and show them like, listen, oh, like how many times have you been on with a customer and customers like, oh, I didn't actually think about that. That actually would be a big difference, right? There's just, mm-hmm. there's just so much that there's so many steps you need to take before we really get to like a final product and just being patient and understanding that I think is so, so valuable. So I think that's so huge that you guys are doing that mm-hmm. in, in such a, an effective way. Thank you. So while building this new company, I'm like, I'm sure there are a lot of things that kind of jumped out at you and caught you off guard. What Every what are day. some of those things? Every day. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> uh, and I'll start with you, Joris, on the technical side. What are some things that are that that have come up that have just like really caught you off guard, um, either on a technical side or even just on on the business side? And then um, yes. we'll have you answer too. So we are. Um... An original um, a duo, would I say, with Carl, because I'm the French speaker of the company, even though that Carl do speak French. Uh, so I handled also the the legal accountant and HR stuff, which is mainly using some of the existing new platform we have, like Penny Lane, Payfit, and Conto, uh, which mm-hmm. are French startups uh, doing payment accountant stuff. So I have this to handle, but if I put that away, on the tech side, uh, I have uh, an army of internship, uh, of interns, and uh, when you work with them, you have to be careful of what you give them to do, and the reviewing process is not the same as when you are working with someone you you are used to be working. I was working at ODF before with experimented developers. You don't check the work. It's done, it's working, you know it's working, but with interns, <laughs> you still have to check a little bit because... Still First, learning. you have to read it, and 
you don't even understand the name of the variable. What this function is for? I mean, if there is not even no comments, no explicit variables, I don't know what it's for. So this is sometimes is taking me time. So I'm giving rules. So now I have, and this list of rules is increasing every day. I have a list of six rules that I give to the interns to follow so that we don't have strange problem. Like even working with GitHub, when you want to do a commit and they've been pushing on the wrong branch or the remote and the local is not at the same step and they are saying, yes, I have a bug and you don't see it on the GitHub and you have to do on a Zoom call to check that they pushed the code they had. So it's, it's like kind of small problems that as a senior dev, you don't face anymore. But with interns, mm -hmm. you face them again. <laughs> so you have to teach, you have to explain, you have to enforce uh, those, those kind of details. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have yet a technical team to help me. Uh, it's also the goal of this summer, a first hire in uh, in the tech side. Uh, so hopefully it's going to make uh, make it easier on the on the future. Working with interns is, it, in all reality, can be like its own thing. It's like there are a group of people at companies that like work specifically like with interns. They, they chose to be there. Um, and just like you outlined, there are all these things that you don't consider as a senior developer that you think is common knowledge. Mm. I mean, it was super funny. We were writing a quote up even the other day at Strides. Um, and I was like, cool. I was like, did we take into account like the developers working on this that who aren't senior developers and they're like oh <laughs> crap they're like i actually never even thought about that um and that's a it's a big thing to consider like in terms of timeline for your for you know your product roadmap um quotes and just uh something you've got to yeah, like really e consider e even internal everyday. documentation yep exactly you yeah, have and to I was have like, even you, internal documentation so that your interns don't have to rely on you to understand the code you made and how to launch mm -hmm. it. Because even if the code speaks from itself, because it's made by a senior developer with good variables, uh, with comments when it's needed, everything is fine. How do I launch it? What is the commands? What are the options of the Docker to, to, to launch it? And mm -hmm. I've been better in the last six months to improve the documentation so that they can work with me in an easier way. Hmm. So it sounds like scaling has been kind of just one of those things that just kind of hit, caught you off guard. What about you, uh, Carl? What is something that, you know, surprised you while starting or jumping into this new venture? Um, well, I second what Jory said about working with interns. First of all, my interns that I work with are, are amazing. Like they really are fantastic. Like they, they themselves have surprised me of the quality of the work considering they're still at university. I don't know if I was that yeah. efficient when I was at uni, um, but they are still learning at the same time. And there are certain things you take for granted having, you know, like I've worked in work for decades, you know, I've put it that way. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, there are certain things, habits that you, you know, you do naturally and they're not doing so you have to spend a lot of time reviewing their work I would say that's the thing that that surprised me the most is that the amount of time I spend rev reviewing work you know like if we're sending out questions for example in, a, in an interview on Rumble I have to review the questions and check the wording and, and these kinds of things and that takes time you know like it really it really does yep. uh, the other thing that really surprised me um, having come from China to Europe to France uh, is the level of support that exists for startups in France and in Europe in general. It's just amazing. Like the the number of programs there are, the government support. Um, it's It really blew me away that the amount of different organizations there are there to support startups, the amount of funding programs there are. There's Europe-wide ones that we just, just got accepted into Media Motor Europe. Um, I'm not sure, actually, I'm not supposed to announce that right now. So maybe <laughs> maybe you have to wait until we actually publish that, but really happy about that one. Um, and uh and we've been supported by Cap Digital, who are coaching us through the the quite complicated process of accessing government funds through the BPE, which is the remind me, Joris, the, the boss uh, uh, Banque Publique d'Investissement, Banque Publique, the public bank of investment. Yeah, so France has got a load of money for startups, but you have to jump for a lot of hoops to get it. Uh, and there, so there are other organisations that help you jump through those hoops, and one of them is Cap Digital, and they've been fantastic. But anyway, um, long story short, if you're a startup and you're looking to um, get some initial cash, then make uh, as much uh, use of the, the government funded programs in your area, which might not be immediately uh, obvious, but seek them out or seek out organizations that can help you find them and, and go through the process because it really helps. And the most crucial thing is it's non-dilutive funding most of the time. So you're not giving away equity in your company. 
They're usually loans with incredibly favorable terms, like you pay nothing for three years, then you got five years to pay it back interest free, something like that. Um, wow. So definitely check that out. So Carl, going along with that, and, and this is going to be a question for, for both of you, but let's just say that we jump in to a time machine because George writes some amazing code and figures out how to warp through time. And we're able to go back to that first time that you guys sat at Entrepreneur First, that meeting that you two sat. What advice would you guys give yourselves at the very, very beginning? Uh, so George is over here like, how do I, how do I work through time? How do I get through time? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. okay. Can you get him? Yeah. Uh, we, we started at the very beginning, we had an idea of the product and we started right away with a conversational designer and a UI designer. Mm. And a posteriori, I would say that it was too soon. So we spent a lot of money on them for something we don't use yet. And this was already nine months ago. And when you are a startup and your cash burn is important, you have to check it, you have to be careful. This was too soon for me. So I would change that. Wait for this September, so one year later. So you think one of the one of the big things that you would change is not going and getting like a UI UX designer first. Yeah, it's it's it had an influence on the app itself. So the prototype, the first prototype was independent of design, but for the second one, we tried to match the design. So I forced mm -hmm. myself to comply to it, to do the handoff, to convert the design into code. This takes time. Mm -hmm. But after iteration, you move something, you change it, and you have to update your UI library. And this is this takes time at a moment where you want to go fast on the features. So mm -hmm. what I would do is put this away from the very beginning. So even do the expense of getting this UI later because mm -hmm. the project is going to be clearer this summer. So we will have a product that changed a lot, even the way you use it. So the mm -hmm. screens are not the same. The features are not the same. The workflow are not the same. So even though some components will be used, I'm not saying it's to put away. Yeah. I'm just going to say it was too soon. So some components will be used, but some of them will have to be adapted a lot. And I use them too much, and it makes me lose a lot of time by using mm. it too soon. No, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And that's something that like we, even at Strides, have like worked super hard to create like a components library so that we're not having to spend more time building custom components or something else in development. So it's like, I, I think there, there are two things to that. One, like if you're going to like a U, like a design studio or whatever to have something built, like it's super important to get like that technical feedback just so you know which of these like technical components are super hard to build, which ones are easy, and that way you can iterate on that design. Um, and then the basically the other side to that, do you think that... <clears throat> that design is irrelevant now in the sense that your product has gone a different direction than that initial design that you had right now? Do you think that you basically built the design at an early enough stage where the product changed by the time that you could actually go back and implement a lot of those designs? I think the design screen we got are still relevant for a vision of the product we have, but not for the platform we have today. Mm, that makes sense. So we have to do an hybrid combination of what can we reuse? Should we reuse it? Should we invest time on implementing it? Or should mm -hmm. we wait until we reach this point? We have a lot of design on the AI parts, speaking with the users on the screen where you have the chatbot speaking with people, recording them, but we don't have mm -hmm. that yet. So this is useless for now, but still mm. I, I, yeah. I, will keep, I, I would keep it, but just later. Yep. Yeah, you no, that you makes a lot of sense. Time. Carl, what about what about you? What would you tell you? Um, I would say I would try and manage my own expectations when it came to raising money. Um, Entrepreneur First are looking for billion-dollar companies, so they, they push you to go big or go home, which is not really the approach that Joris and I have taken with the business. Um, and so they're interested in like uh, like unicorns, essentially, like the one they've just had. Uh, and mm -hmm. what that does to the entrepreneur is like try and make you maybe reach a little bit beyond yourself and try and uh, you know exaggerate your the size of the, the possible business that you're you're looking to create a hundred million dollar business is, uh, is is fine for most people but for you know these incubators they're looking for billion dollar businesses and what they encourage you to do is and, and what they arrange for you very successfully is to meet loads of VCs venture capitalists 
very early on in the process. But these VCs generally only invest in companies that have a lot more traction uh, and have a lot more to, to show for themselves uh, down the line. But because this incubator has recommended you, they'll take the meeting. And so we spent a lot of time, me especially, spent a lot of time speaking to VCs. You know, I became very, you know, very experienced at speaking to, to investors. They're very nice. And, you know, I learned a lot in the process. But the the, the answer again and again was too early. Come and speak to us in six to 12 months when you got a bit more traction, a few more users, products a bit more developed. And I felt like we wasted quite a bit of time at the beginning doing that. Uh, it would have been better if we'd had more, com you know, introductions to, to business angels and people who really do invest right at the, the early stages for a company that was only a few months old or just put it off and just give us more time to build the product before we then have those conversations and so i don't know whether in you know in these schemes sometimes you don't have a choice you have to follow the, the path but just be aware that you know you're not gonna you're not gonna just land a you know a million dollars after you know working together for three months um and uh yeah take this you know take the the longer approach basically the, the long game yeah working with vcs is a like it's a whole thing in the sense that like you've got to whether you believe it or not you've got to convince yourself and them that you're a unicorn mm. or else they don't want to fund you and then two as soon as you do get that funding you're in like this weird position to where you have to start focusing more on the revenue and less on mm. the product and let's be honest anybody like who initially goes into tech usually is going into it because they see a problem and they're passionate about solving that initial problem. And when you take that focus away from mm. making the product better and just on the revenue, that's a really hard transition for a founder. So Yeah, for sure. But, and it can completely, you know, derail the roadmap as well because you'll be like, okay, well, yep. this doesn't look like a big enough market, even though that's what I really want to do. But we could go yep. after, you know, this HR market, which is enormous, but, you know, I don't really want to create another recruitment tool. So, you know what I mean? This, uh, <laughs> like, you don't want to really have to be torn between those two choices. Uh, I'd much rather create something that I'm, you know, I'd be really proud of. You know, you only get one life. So I feel like you should really spend your time working on something you really believe in. And that's where you'll yep. do your best work as well. And sometimes that means saying no, but often means saying no to opportunities that come along. So, yeah. yep, totally agree. Um, as the last like wrap up question, you know, for all these founders or new business owners listening to this, is there any like last piece of advice that you'd give them? Any like parting words? Um. <laughs> Go and be an entrepreneur. <laughs> Do it now. Don't. Yeah, that, I'd probably say that. Take action. Uh, don't put it off. Don't think you know. I'll start a business after I get X amount of money or when I hit a certain age. You're only getting older. You'll probably have a family and stuff. So just do it as soon as possible. One of the best decisions I ever made was moving to China, which, you know, I was working in a cushy job in London, earning a decent salary and, you know, definitely going to earn, you know, more over the next few years. But it wasn't for me. So, you know, I just dropped everything uh, and moved to China. And even though I was earning a lot less and my career was, you know, like massively stalled, you know, career in, in quotes, it was one of the best things I ever did because it was a very, you know, enriching, pro you know, environment. Got to try all sorts of different stuff. Uh, and it's led to a lot of opportunities and made me into a much more kind of, uh, I don't know, creative and interesting person, I think, than if I'd gone down the, the typical kind of consulting path that a lot of people did. And so if you do want to create a startup, then do whatever it takes to to make sure you you can do it and you keep doing it. That's what I would say. Yeah, you got to You got to commit when you're going to go in mm. for sure. What about what about you, Joris? Any any advice you want to give these founders who are trying to recruit their technical co-founder? <laughs> uh, that's a hard question because as I said at the beginning I, I did EF twice and first uh -huh. team I went to the jury with was someone who didn't understand what I was doing and uh, it was the problem finally that's why we broke up because when I was explaining stuff the eye was like empty and I was like okay I have to repeat <laughs> myself so if you want to have a tech guy in your team and uh I mean, maybe learn a little bit of it. I would say it's hard for someone doing business side to learn to dev. I don't say you should learn how to do Python. I'm just saying mm -hmm. uh, have a minimum of a culture to understand what's happening and to not have those empty dialogues that I hate. And uh, yeah, just do a little bit of effort to understand who you're working with. Sweet. Yeah. I, again, thank you, uh, Joris, and thank you, Carl, for jumping on the How to Build thank Now you. podcast. Um, yeah. Where you know, where can everybody find you? Yeah, so you can uh, sign up for a free account at rumble.studio. So go and create some uh, asynchronous audio right now. Sign up the newsletter, rumble.studio slash newsletter. Uh, check out the blog, rumble.studio uh, rumble slash blog. And of course, uh, the podcast, rumble.studio slash podcast. There we go. Okay, we'll add those. We'll add all those links to our 
to our uh, show notes. So yeah, uh, if you're do. listening, go to those show notes and find those links there. And of course, we're on all the social, all the socials as well. Just search for Rumble Studio Singular and look for the big yellow logo, and we'll be there. Uh, of course, you can find uh, me and Joris on, on LinkedIn, uh, Carl Robinson and Joris Gary. Perfect. 